Greetings and salutations, YouTube. My name is Jacob Toman. I serve as the lead pastor at Ada CRC in Michigan, and I am going to be joined here today for our Eschatology Matters discussion by doctor and author Joshua Howard, who is also a featured speaker here at Eschatology Matters. It's a wonderful discussion with Dr. Howard about his new book, Stories About the End of Things. Dr. Howard serves as pastor at Grace Community Church in Battle Creek, Michigan, and in today's discussion, we get a chance to ask Dr. Howard all sorts of questions about this wonderful wonderfully new, well-written book, Stories About the End of Things. If you are new to the channel here at Eschatology Matters, you can, of course, like, subscribe, and ding the bell to be notified about future video discussions just like this one. And, of course, you can also join the channel as a member in order to support all the discussions and ministry that goes on here at Eschatology Matters. With that introduction aside, let's jump over to today's discussion with Dr. Howard. Dr. Howard, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, man. Good to be back with you, Jacob. Yeah, this is going to be a fun discussion. So we are here today talking about stories about the end of things. This is a book that is available, has now become available. It was released on September 26th. The subtitle is Revealing Themes of Eschatology Through Scripture. And this is written by Joshua Howard, and it comes out from College and Clayton Press. And I just want to give you a couple of quotes here for our audience about this particular book. I've gotten to read an advanced copy of it. It was very, very edifying and helpful and encouraging to me. And so for me, serving as a pastor here up in Michigan and getting to worship from time to time with Josh, this isn't just personal bias that's coming at you. This is somebody who has read uh, Dr. Howard's book and has benefited from uh, stories here about eschatology. And I'm even quoting it here in an upcoming sermon uh, series. That's the plan, at least. Here's a quote, though, from a couple others who have gotten a chance to read stories in advance. Dr. Ken Gentry had to say this, Joshua Howard has written a valuable work that well captures the fundamental significance of biblical eschatology. As one who has written much in the field of eschatology, I personally am delighted to commend this book to thinking Christians today. And then Dr. Kim Riddlebarger also had this to say, there are a great many books on eschatology. This one is different. This makes for a very interesting and compelling read. So with all those accolades and with all that being said, it's our delight to get to interview and spend some time with you today, Dr. Howard. And I'd love to hear just first off, what made you say, hey, I need to write stories about the end of things? What was it that was the impulse, the drive, the motivating factor that made you sit down and say, I've got to tell these stories about the end of things and people need to be reading and thinking about them? Yeah, no, th thanks so much for that, Jacob. And and honestly, you reading those those uh, commendations, the, the commendations part is like, to me, it's the most awkward phase of book writing because you're reaching out to people and you're begging them not only to read your book, which is still in the editing process, but then to, you know, say how much they love it. Um, but I'm, I'm really grateful, especially for guys like uh, Ken Gentry in particular. He just gave me a, a lot of constructive feedback. Really grateful um, for those guys to uh, to yeah, lend their time and their their expertise. But um, yeah, the book came about. Um, honestly, I wanted to write something fun on eschatology. Um, I wanted to write something uh, that was just unrelated to anything else I was writing on at the time. Um, and, and one of the things that kind of drove me in eschatology in general, I remember uh, early on in seminary, I remember a professor um, kind of kind of good naturedly observing that there is a, a giant problem of the New Testament. He, he described it as the dilemma of the New Testament. And uh, obviously he wasn't saying that the Bible had issues, but he was saying that there's this constant tension between Christ is victorious and yet Satan seems to be doing a lot of work in this world. Uh, uh, the the heavens have dawned in essence, and yet there's still a lot of darkness around. The light's shining, and yet the darkness pervades. That whole tension that we live in um, after Christ's first coming. So I wanted to write on something of that and sort of introduce people not not to what I see as a problem, and I'm I'm, I'm quite sure that professor obviously didn't think it was a problem either, but just introduce people into that huge story of Scripture. Um, I really grabbed onto that idea of story, um, and if if anybody reads the book, you'll you'll notice I'm shamelessly stealing that idea of story, and specifically great story from C.S. Lewis. Um, but that's the way Scripture is communicated. You know, that's one of the things we've tried to do on this this Eschatology Matters channel is communicate Scripture not as a uh, not as a you know a, a bank of proof texts. Um, that not that there's anything wrong with proof texts in their proper place, but still, this is not. This is not some sort of segmented story. This is one huge, grandiose story that God's writing. And when, when you get these little glimpses of it, um, you, you get a sense of that that beauty and that awe and that wonder. Um, I, I can shamelessly say I've, I've had to reread this book, obviously, many times during the editing process. And it encourages me every time I come back and revisit those chapters, just because it gives you little glimpses of it. Um, the, the way I tried to approach it in the book was looking specifically toward the end of things. Um, we, we look toward specifically those final chapters in the Revelation. And you're looking at God consummating all things to himself. And I tried to just pick out some of the themes that I thought were the most 
uh, maybe the most poignant or maybe even the most confusing. So we picked out some themes like light, uh, the serpent, the sea, um, the wilderness, the, these various themes that pop up toward the end. And the idea was just to look at them throughout scripture. If this is how the story kind of concludes or at least consummates, how are these themes building toward that point with the hopes that if you understand kind of that flow of the story and specifically how those things are flowing through the story, the end isn't intimidating. It's not confusing. That that doesn't mean it's not challenging, but it's encouraging. It, it's something that gives life to the story as opposed to confusing us toward the end. So, yeah, that was that was the initial approach. Um, the, the biggest issue in this book was limiting myself to to themes because you know if, if you were to ask i mean if we were to do a poll like what themes ought to be included i think my original list had like 21 themes mm-hmm. and, and obviously we had to chop that down significantly um you know otherwise it would have been a, a thousand pages but yeah that's that's kind of the general impetus of the book and the, the way i tried to tried to take its direction yeah that's great and that's fun to hear about the themes as well maybe we'll do a bonus recap uh read through episode later on and, and we'll get to Having read the book all together as a group, we can pick your brain on some of the themes that you didn't get to include in the book. That's always fun to see what what didn't make it in. But that's very encouraging just to hear from you about the overall, the overarching story of eschatology and how you're helping and hoping uh, to give people a sense of that great picture and what an encouraging picture it is, even in the midst of darkness and even in the midst of struggle and even in the midst of challenge. There's also yet great hope. Uh, all throughout the story. I'm reminded just as I was reading through the book and as we're chatting here today about um, that quote, that a story is that which has a beginning and a middle and an end. And that came through, I feel like as I was reading through stories about the end of things, that came through in each thematic chapter that you had kind of a structure to each chapter of a beginning a middle and an end, a clear introduction of the theme, a clear exposition of that theme throughout scripture, and then some clear concluding points with even some review questions at the end of the chapter to be able to provide for uh, discussion, which was very, very helpful. And so I would just ask you, uh, as you were writing and as you were working through some of those different questions and some of those different themes, what was it that led you to say, okay, here's a good discussion question. I'm asking this pastorally, right? Good questions are obviously a big foundation for ministry. It, Jesus showed us the way. He constantly was asking good questions. How did you come up with some of the good questions that you came up with for stories, and how did you evaluate them? Because some of them, as I found as I came through to the end of the chapters, like for instance on wilderness and darkness, I was going, man, these are some pretty heavy questions, but these are good questions that the scriptures actually answer. So how did you go about that process of developing? These are the questions that I really want to include, and I want to make sure that people have something to take away from this chapter with. Yeah, no, that's a it's a it's a huge challenge to come up with with good questions. You know, it's easy to come up with questions. But um, I, I noticed somebody uh, commented recently, like especially on like panel discussions when you're hosting, you know, a couple different voices. It's really hard for that person to ask good questions, you know, worthwhile questions. Um, honestly, kind of selfishly, I was looking at the questions I had, you know, um, just working through the text. Um, having experienced the text early on in ministry, but then also walking through these themes with with various um, teaching settings, whether in church or the, in the academy, um, just thinking through those different ways those those questions have popped up. So really, most of those questions I tried to I tried to stick to questions which would um, sort of reveal the whole theme. But I was also thinking toward those that had given me the most encouragement as I walked through. Um, one of the things I mentioned, I think it's in the introduction of the book. Um, the book was almost titled practical eschatology. Um, that was the original working title. And I think it's still, I think it's still the file folder that I have the the document saved under. Um, we went away from that title just because it sounds a little bit academic, but that, that was essentially the, the thought behind it was, um, you want, you want orthodoxy, right? We want right belief in our eschatology and, you know, and everything we do with, with scriptural reflection. Um, but we also want orthopraxy. We want that orthodoxy, that right belief to establish orthopraxy, right practice. So not just knowing or believing correct things, but also those things influencing the way we we live. And then one of the things I was trying to push into um, specifically with the questions in this book is orthocardia, um, that that idea of right heart. The, the fact that when when we work through these themes of eschatology, they shouldn't they shouldn't lead us to some sort of dry academic reflection. These are supposed to change the way we feel, the, the, change the way our heart beats in this world. So that was kind of some of the impetus behind those questions was what will what will not only challenge people to really dig into these themes, but also what what, what sort of questions can move them toward loving the God that's behind this story? Um, th- that to me is the whole beauty of eschatology. We're all challenged 
you get into the the night visions in Daniel or where, whatever your problem section of scripture is, those are challenging and we should never pretend like they're not challenging. And yet at the same time, the, the impetus behind eschatology is not to confuse and challenge us. It really is to make our hearts beat differently. Um, I hope the book does that. I hope the questions guide toward that. That was part of my thinking behind this. I have not taught through this material, um, that, at least in, not in the way that it's set up. Um, but my thought behind it was I, I wanted to encourage churches, church leaders, pastors to be able to walk somebody through this who's completely unfamiliar with eschatology, maybe even unfamiliar with their their Bible by and large, and yet walk them into um, maybe not even using the word eschatology, walk them into a big story that God has written to the extent that their heart beats differently when they read these themes in Scripture. That was that was the goal behind it. Yeah, and I think you accomplish that in the book, by the way. Again, just speaking as a fellow brother, I think this is a wonderful book that can be used in a small group setting, in a Sunday school setting, in a prayer group setting, in a men's or women's group setting. Because you've already packed the questions there at the end of each chapter, I think there is something here um, to really drive folks to the hope of eschatology and the hope of the resolution of the problem in the New Testament, right? Of Christ's ultimate triumphal return. And I, I felt like as I was reading through stories, this is not a typical eschatology book, right? That's It's not. It is different. It is unique. And that was actually incredibly refreshing, right? Yeah. The first three chapters are not, let's debate the millennium and really talk about X, Y, and Z, about arrival timelines. That's not what you write about. You write about the encouraging aspects of what God's word has revealed of what he's doing and what he has done. And that was incredibly helpful. And I find myself so often in conversations with folks just trying to go, eschatology is its so encouraging. Why are we getting stuck in the mud on so many of these, like we say around here on Eschatology Matters? Why are we getting stuck on the weeds on so many of these things? There's so much hope and so much joy and so much um, Christian living that can be informed by these particular themes as we see them, as the Bible unpacks them. And so thank you for your great work with that. I've, I've already been benefiting from the book, but that's just me personally. Talk to me a little bit more about the audience that you were hoping to capture and the audience that you were hoping to reach with this. You've said already, hey, we went away from a title that was going to be maybe a bit more academic. I think the work is very, very accessible for folks to dive in and to jump in and to read. I don't think that this is going to be something that's overwhelming, like you said, to somebody maybe who's not even familiar with their Bibles. I think someone who's never read a Bible before would be able to pick up stories and benefit from it, as well as pastors who are going to be preaching and teaching on many of these themes or passages that you bring up. Talk to us a little bit more about the audience that you had in mind and that you were prayerfully considering as you were writing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, the audience is, I mean, honestly, it's the person in the pew um, is, is kind of who I was trying to write this book to. Um, you know, in, in the dedication, I dedicated it to my kids um, I'm I'm looking greatly forward to. I don't have my author copies in hand yet, which I'm chafing to get the, to get that box in. But no, I'm looking forward to giving this to my my daughter. Um, you know, who's 14 years old, but she can she can grapple with these these concepts. So the idea was to make this accessible to the person in the pew. Um, but I asked the publisher early on if we could make room, specifically in the footnotes, because I'm a purist. Um, make room in the footnotes for uh, maybe further study, for further reflection, for those who might want to dig in a little bit deeper. And they were kind enough to accommodate that. So there's footnoted material, and there's also some appendices. Um, for those who want to dig a little deeper and see where I'm coming from. Uh, but yeah, the, the general impetus was somebody that does not have those academic categories. And that's not dismissive. That's just saying like somebody that hadn't been to seminary, they're, they're not used to walking through these eschatological categories. Um, this can walk you into that conversation. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that, uh, that, that there's no millennial view championed. Um, and that's, that's, that's by purpose, not to be sneaky at all. If, if you read the, the preface that I wrote, um, you know, I give a little tip of the cap to kind of where I'm coming from in general. Um, but yeah, the book wasn't to champion post-millennialism, amillennialism, pre-millennialism. Um, my hope was that there's a lot that we agree on in general orthodox eschatology. We can agree on these themes. We can see that flow of scripture. That doesn't mean somebody, anybody can find something in there to disagree with, I'm sure, um, as with any good book. But uh, at the same time, we can all appreciate that flow and theme of scripture um, without getting into maybe some of those more nuances that, are, that have their place and have their, um, have their you know, times for debate. And yet that's not what this is aiming toward. Yeah, and because you wrote this focusing and emphasizing on stories and themes, it's so encouraging. I felt like it's a page turner in that because there's this really clear beginning, middle, end flow, you want to you want to read a whole chapter, right? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not written as like you said an academic work. It's not written as an encyclopedia of eschatology topics. It's written 
in such a way that you're drawn into these stories. You're drawn into each chapter to go, well, how does the Bible speak about these things? What, why does light matter in contrast to darkness throughout the great story of Scripture? How does exile play into wilderness? And when we're reading through wilderness passages in the Old Testament, what does that have to do with anything? And why does that matter for us today? I mean, you just draw us in both through your writing style, but also through wonderful exposition of Scripture. And you draw us in to say, okay, what's what's going on here and what can we take away from God's Word in this big story of what's going on, of what has gone on, of what is going on and what will go on in the mm-hmm. end? And then how does that encourage and inform us? I Again, I was just tremendously encouraged by it. I don't have the 14-year-old daughter. I've got the 12-year-old. And so once I get my copy of this hard copy, I'm sure she's going to enjoy reading it because the themes that are here and the structures of each chapter are just, they're so rich and they're so encouraging. And so anybody that's doing biblical study on this, whether you're 12 or whether you're, I don't know, 100, you're going to find something that's of benefit to you here as you refresh your take and refresh your soul uh, on what God's word has to say about the end of things. Well, let me ask you, how did working on stories challenge your faith and strengthen your faith and maybe bring you joy in serving the Lord? Writing sometimes can be a challenge. Sometimes it can be just an absolute delight. What was it that was challenging to you? What was it that was enjoyable to you? What was it that strengthened you as you were doing this research and as you were writing stories about the ends of things? Yeah, man, that's such a, that's such a good question. Whenever... <laughs> You know, writing something like this. So essentially, these are you know what they would classify as biblical theological themes, right? We're we're taking a theme, um, or a, or a you know kind of a thread. We're tracing it out through scripture. So that's that's kind of the general approach. Um, and whenever you do something like that, you want to have guardrails. You know, any anybody needs guardrails. I'm I'm one who's kind of stringent with my my research, so I have very strict guardrails, and you don't want to wander too far and apply things outside the the, the categories that they need to be. Um, and yet it's just amazing. Every time you do a deep dive into scripture on, on any given topic, there's just there's just so much so much height and breadth that we don't touch on. Um, and, and, and that's not to say that we can just go wildly, um, you know, far afield with our application or our, 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 uh, our analogies. But there's a depth to scripture. So many ways scripture just ties things together to the point that I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, we'll we'll all go to glory and have never even scratched the surface of all that scripture communicates in those regards. So as I was as I was reading that, you 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 get these fascinating little themes. You get these really fascinating little connections to all the other themes. By the time you're getting toward the end of the book, I'm I'm sure you're starting to see they all flow together. They're all starting to kind of interweave together, and you're you're seeing that. But then you're recognizing just the beauty of this story that God's written. God God didn't write a boring story. Um, any anybody that comes to scripture and, and considers it to be kind of dull or or monotonous, you're just you're missing the the beauty of it and. If anything, I, I'm hoping that that can be one thing that encourages others because that always encourages me. And especially with something like this, where, it, as I said, it was just a side project. This was something that I just wanted to do just because I thought it hadn't been done quite like this. And and I wanted uh, to encourage others. Whenever you're doing one of those things, it's the beauty that shines through Scripture that just confronts you. And just it, it just makes you love the God who has written such a beautiful story. Um, you know, I mentioned that I, I steal shamelessly, shamelessly from uh, C.S. Lewis and, and many others in here, but... But C.S. Lewis had that whole conception of um, coming further up and further in. Um, that's what I hope this this can be just a little bit of an introduction, a little bit of a, um, you know, very introductory material that doesn't challenge or doesn't doesn't uh, intimidate anybody. But it can be a little beckoning of come further up and further in, dig, dig, dig deeply into this story that God has written and just appreciate the beauty of what he's leading us to. It, it's, it's a glorious story. Um, there's, there's many of us who have, you know, you mentioned eschatology matters and kind of our aims on this channel. And, um, there's many who encounter eschatology and come away sad or come away depressed. I hope this can be like one of those examples of how your eschatology should lead to joy and hope that, that it's a victorious story. No matter your eschatol- eschatological view, Christ is King. He is consummating all things. This should make you really just joyful and wondrous of what God's written. So that's kind. Of, that was kind of part of my journey. I hope that comes through for for the reader as well. Yeah, I think so. It it did for me. There wasn't a chapter that I came away going, "My goodness, this is depressing." I came away sometimes going, "This is heavy." Whoa! <laughs> yeah. Like the depressing even... chapters got cut. They're on the they're on the writing room floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I came away going, "This is really heavy, and this is impactful. This is this is informative for the way how I love my wife, for the way how I interact with my kids, 
for the way how I work as an employee, for the ways how I lead. Um, it, it, it was incredible to think back through and to go, okay, each of these themes is found. And I think it, the book does a great job and you do a great job of, of really explaining and walking folks through these different themes that are available and revealed throughout all of scripture. Mm-hmm. That eschatology isn't just limited to a few passages here or there. We've, like you said, we've all got our problem passages, but these themes that come up about the end of things, they're all over the place. And so that was something that was very encouraging uh, to me. That awesome. eschat- eschatology isn't just something that we can just go, well, you know, we'll only preach on eschatology when we get to Revelation 20. It's all over the place. The themes are everywhere. Well, how should readers get a hold of your book, Josh? Tell us a little bit more about where folks can grab a hold of stories about the end of things. Yeah, the easiest place is just Amazon. Um, you know, it, it, it's available through Amazon today, in fact, uh, which again, not thrilled that you can get two day shipping from Prime, but I don't have my author copies yet, but we'll make our piece with that later. Um, but yeah, you can get it through Amazon. Um, I've been told the publisher actually opened it up for uh, if church groups are doing it as like a Bible study, because again, this this was one of the applications I hope we can do through it. Um, then if you contact the publisher, which is College and Clayton Press, if you go to their website, just contact them. They've got you know, ordering discounts and stuff like that for bulk orders or for church orders or whatever that might be. But yeah, those would be the two places to check. That's really cool. That's really great. I look forward to being a church that hopefully we can walk through this stuff together because it's really great stuff. And I think it's very impactful for folks, like you said, who are maybe getting stuck or intimidated by other books or other topics or other approaches to eschatology. And so this is a very approachable manner and method for approaching the joyful hope Uh, that we've got revealed in God's word of this great story that's going on. Well, what was a theme or story that you worked on that gave you a chance to learn something new about God's word or God's character or God's people? Was this all just regurgitated sermons that you've already preached on, Josh? Or were you actually doing new research here and going, hey, I haven't seen that before. I need to tell other people about that. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm trying to think of the first guy that I heard. Um, He said that he has to write things out to think them through. I can't remember who that was. I'm not as verbose of a writer as some guys that I've met. Um, some guys just it seems like they they write as easily as they breathe. I'm not quite there, but but this was this was very much um, wanting to explore things that I wasn't able to elsewhere. And for me, that that just comes through writing. So it was a lot of writing and then rewriting and then researching and then editing and um, but that whole process um, for me is is, is kind of like digging up treasure uh, that's hidden in scripture. Um, you know, you you mentioned a second ago of of kind of uh, it being an introduction to to people, to, to that flow of eschatology. I, I think that one of the reasons why eschatology and really Bible study in general, um, it doesn't make sense for people sometimes is because they lose sight of that forest for the trees. You know, we get, we get so honed in and it's sort of inevitable. You hit a problem passage or not even a problem passage. You just hit a difficult section of scripture. You're working through it. You're giving it its due, but you kind of forget the story you're on, where this is headed, what it's done. So for me, every one of these chapters, it's looking at that whole story. So it's that whole Bible eschatology is what we've called it on here. And I think it's a good way of looking at it, a whole Bible view. Um, so, yeah, that, that that was one of the ways that, that I was approaching this. And, and in that in that regard, it wasn't it wasn't anything I was getting to teach through. So this I wasn't able to, to double use this material. But you asked about like a, a theme or a story. Um, it It's hard to pick out a favorite on here. And, and honestly, like I said, there's a lot of a lot of themes that got left on the cutting room floor. Um, but of the nine themes, I think, I think the deep was the one that just fascinated me. Mm. Um, and it's funny how, when you, when you, when you do something like this, I've heard a couple of other guys pick up on this theme of the deep. Obviously I'm not the first one to come up with, um, with that concept either. Uh, but I've heard a couple of other people tracing that theme of the deep through. And if you, if you think about the deep in general, you know, I've always had this, I, I think, I, I think that's how I introduce the chapter. In fact, is kind of, you know, reflecting on floating in a lake. Mm. Um, we used to have these we used to have these lakes in the South and, and we'd float around and you were just very aware of the fact that there was just teeming creatures and an, an entire world floating around beneath your toes. I never liked that feeling. Um, so I don't think there's anything necessarily like evil or sinful about a lake, but, but just thinking about the deep and how the, the pages of scripture open with this conception of the deep, you, you have the spirit hovering over the face of the deep, which is just a powerful, powerful uh, picture in and of itself. But then you have these these manifestations of the deep that we're all very familiar with, but we we rarely kind of connect this theme together. 
Um, and that, that to me, again, going back to your question, that's the beauty of doing a study like this is within 20 pages, um, you know, sitting down for maybe 15, 20 minutes of reading, you can connect all these things and just kind of get a glimpse of it. So you, you've got the deep in the, the initial pages. Um, you have the waters of the deep referenced. And even God, when sin is abounding on the land, causing the deep itself to rise and to cover the face of the earth and to actually wash away all but those who were preserved on Noah's ark. Um, the whole flood narrative is a picture of the deep seemingly triumphing over God's creation, him bringing it up. And then you keep on going and you have God delivering his people directly through waters, parting the sea so that his people would walk through and not just walk through, but walk through on dry land, water, land that had not been affected by the deep and by the, the fear of it. And then one of my favorite parts of that whole story of the deep is coming to that passage. Um, you, you talk about like favorite parts of the book. This is one of my favorite parts of the book is walking through that 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 theme of the deep. And you come to Jesus, hmm. to a passage that so much as a kid, I just relegated to the fact he was showing his disciples something neat where he's walking on the face of a stormy sea. So you have the, you know, the disciples and we're all familiar with the stories. Um, they're out there in the boat. The storm is raging. And then Jesus seemingly as if he's going to pass by the boat, he's walking on the face of the waters. Once you've walked through that theme of the deep, you realize, oh, he's trampling their enemy, the depths, the evil that has swelled up. And even in fact, at one point, cover the face of the earth. He's walking upon those. He's establishing his authority upon those. Um, It's such an amazing picture. And then that carries through with the waters of baptism. And he commands his disciples to be baptized, to baptize, to disciple all the nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, showing that they're passing through those waters. And then by the time you finally get to the end, and this is why we chose the, this is one of the themes, you get to the end and the sea makes its appearance again, but we're told the sea is no more, which again was one of those passages that, that made very little sense to me as a teenager. I was like, well, that's cool. You know, heaven has no oceans, but that, but that's not the point at all, right? It's no, that, that sea, that deep, that foreboding evil that was raised against the people of God. God has not only triumphed over it, walking upon it, but he will one day exp- expel it from his presence. There's water in heaven, but the deep, the sea, its depths and its foreboding, that that is no more. Just just those little pictures like that of the deep, of something seemingly innocuous. It's just kind of a kind of a picture we get throughout scripture, but you tie it together and it it should lead your heart a bit as you reflect mm-hmm. on those pages. So when you get to the revelation, you read the sea is no more. It's not a head scratcher. It's, oh, this makes me love the Lord who has conquered the the depths and led us through to salvation. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. I think that's probably one of the most misinterpreted uh, passages about that the, there will be no more sea there at the end of Revelation. And of course, oh, yeah. both of us serving in Michigan now, it's like we are lake people. You know, like if there's, <laughs> I've, I've had people tell me, well, if there's no water in heaven, I don't want to go. <laughs> you know, and that's so right. it, it, sometimes there's more truth in our humor than we let on, right? About our hermeneutics or our beliefs that we don't quite understand something. And so that chapter is, very, very helpful, I think, as a, as a reference point to walk people through. What What is going on here? What's the symbolism here? What's John talking about? Well, before we get there, let's go take a look in the beginning, right? Anyway, okay, great. Next question for you, Josh. What was some something that, as you were writing, uh, made you laugh as you were working your way through stories about the ends of things? What was something that you were writing, that you researched, that you realized, this is just hilarious. This is awesome. I can't wait to share this. Yeah, this was this is a this is an interesting question because I don't I don't know that I had like a knee slapper as I was working through this something that just made me chuckle. Um, But there was a couple of amusing things. You know, one one of the things I'm constantly uh, reminded of, and and only the other writers and researchers among us will will really laugh at this joke is that um, many of the quotes that I know didn't actually happen. So you're always confronted with that sort of thing. For example, Martin Luther didn't say 90% of the things Martin Luther said. And that's always frustrating for people. <laughs> um, those who have had to research him will, will get a chuckle. Um, no, the, I th- there was two amusing things that kind of kind of stuck out. Uh, one of them came early in the book in the, the chapter on watching. Um, I don't think I've ever encountered that passage in Acts without chuckling a little bit. You know, Christ has risen from the grave. He's He's appeared to many. Um, he's spoken many words of, of of comfort, and then he has ascended to the Father, and his disciples were left. And this is how kind of the book of Acts, you know, the Gospels have concluded. The book of Acts is now launching in, and you get this this picture of the disciples just staring into heaven. 
And it, it never ceases to amuse me thinking of his disciples to the point where the angels had to be sent and tell them, men of Galilee, why are you looking into heaven? You have a task that you've been assigned to go, um, in essence, to shake them a bit by the shoulders. That 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 <laughs> The Bible's rich with humor that it doesn't really, it doesn't come out unless you appreciate it. God has a sense of humor with those things that his disciples, I wonder how long they stood there to the point where God decreed that some angels descend from heaven <laughs> above to, to come to the earth. Um, so that was, that was one of the amusing ones, but I think the one, the one that was probably my favorite, um, and it's not, it's not like, I, like I said, it's not like a knee slapper funny, but it was Robert Louis Stevenson, um, describing the lamp lighters. This, this came out in the chapter on the light. Um, and Robert Louis Stevenson, he had this, he had this, this, it's usually paraphrased, um, observation he had about the lamp lighters. Obviously this, you know, this is early without electricity. Men would go down the street lighting the lamps at night. Um, Robert Louis uh, Stevenson was very, you know, famously sick as a child. He's bedridden, um, not unlike Calvin when Calvin was writing the Institutes, kind of confined to bed during these formative times of their life. But anyway, so he looks out the window and it's usually paraphrased that he said that it looked like they were punching holes in the night, which I quite like the paraphrase. Um, but the actual quote is, is something, the, something, something to the effect of that they were knocking luminous holes in the darkness, which is essentially, you know, early English for punching holes in the darkness. <laughs> um, that always, that always amused me because when you read things like John one and you're confronted by the fact that the light has shown into the world, there's a world of darkness. The light has shown and is yet shining. The darkness hates it and yet has not overcome it. We, we look at that and we're struck by the grandeur of God. We're struck by the, the magnificence of Christ and the glory of Christ. And all those things are so true. John one is rich. Um, and yet at the same time, we, we kind of miss the. It's not humor exactly, but it's quite the picture that God's punching a hole into the darkness of this world with the light of his son. It's it's a hole that has been punched into the darkness. I just love that that one from Robert Louis Stevenson, who even in the midst of seeing something that is serious, we, we can recognize the fact that, that God's quite humorous with the way he pulls these things off mm -hmm. to send his almighty son to be born of a virgin mm -hmm. in a manger. Um, God has an intense sense of humor with, with the way he redeems, with the way he achieves cosmic victory, and yet he does it through the most miraculous circumstances. Um, so those those are some of the things that kind of just stuck out that I found just personally humorous. Yeah, that's great. No, very encouraging. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Well, what are some questions that you hope, let's say there's a small group, a study, a Sunday school class, everybody's around and they're reading through stories about the ends of things, and they've got some questions coming away from it. What are some questions that you hope you leave people with as they read through the book? What are some questions that you hope stick with people and inform their living moving forward? Or what are some questions that you hope linger? You know, good questions oftentimes linger. Jesus asked really good questions. You and your book have asked really good questions at the end of some of your chapters. What are some questions that you hope linger in the minds of folks as they come away from stories about the end of things? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Anytime you're approaching scripture with something like this, well, I'll say this to begin with. I, I would say, what else is a good question? You know, I've mentioned several times, I had many things that were on the cutting room floor on this one. Um, I would love it if people would ask, what else? Because these aren't comprehensive. This is not every picture in scripture, not even close to scratching the surface, right? Even with eschatologically dominant uh, pictures within scripture. So I would love it if people would just say, what else? Even if they were to, to read from some of the quote unquote difficult uh, places in scripture, read through the revelation, and just consider what what what's the brush that God is using to paint this picture in Revelation? Uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature and prophetic literature as well, but specifically apocalyptic writing is just it's rich imagery, right? Like God is painting a picture for us. What's what's the paint that He uses? What 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 brush strokes does He employ? And then just ask yourself, like, wh what might we see in Scripture of those things? If if it leads people in that direction, I would count this book a huge success because that's where you're starting to get into some of the some of the beauty and the grandeur of Scripture is saying, how does this build and what is it building to and how is God accomplishing that? Um, that 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 to me was the whole joy behind writing the book in the first place. Um, I think I think a second one would be similar to it is how are these things connected to one another? Um, it was difficult at times to not write about two or three themes at once because they're so interwoven, it's oftentimes even in the same passage, right? You'll have one verse and it's using these themes of light and dark, but at the same time, it's using these themes of a wilderness and an exodus. Um, just seeing how those themes not only weave together, but complement one another. They help us understand one another. 
Um, the, the hope is as we read through those themes and as we can consider the way that God has has painted this this uh this tapestry, we, we understand or painted this picture rather, we understand that those themes are meant to help us understand the other colors. Mm-hmm. Some of them are accentuating other colors, some of them are the dominant colors, but they help us understand the story more. Um I would also encourage though, it just just from a pastoral standpoint, there's there's usually two impetuses or two kind of uh two kind of ways we read scripture when it comes to application specifically. Sometimes we say, you know, how does this help me? Um, or, or not maybe even help. How does this impact me? How does this impact my Christian walk? Um, I remember there was a professor, he used to always, whenever we would pontificate a bit too much in class, you probably had the same experience, Jacob. Um, whenever we would get a little bit too high-minded, a little too theological, he would always say in this thick country accent, he'd say, what, what does that have to do with the price of milk and eggs? Um, and it used to aggravate me so badly, but his point was well taken, right? Like, you know, theology should touch down, right? It should touch down. There should be practical application. I agree. I would also say the other the other question to ask is not just how does this impact me in my life? How does this make me appreciate and know God more? Um, if the Christian life is kind of bound up in not just knowing ourselves, but first and foremost, knowing who God is, what he's done and how he has called us. Um, I hope these threads will help people appreciate what sort of God has painted that tapestry. What, what, what sort of God is weaving together these stories and making this mosaic, this tapestry that we can reflect upon and is bringing it to a conclusion. If it, if it leads us toward appreciating the God who's written the story, I think that'll be a huge success. And that'll also be instructive. I think that's the way we're supposed to read scripture, no matter where we find ourselves, even if it's in one of the the epistles and it's a very straightforward passage, you know, you're doing the sinful thing, stop doing the sinful thing, something very straightforward. Always consider what, what does this tell us about God and how can I love him more uh, through that reflection? Yeah, that's well said. It makes me think of <clears throat> nobody in particular comes to mind, just a whole bunch of paraphrases. I've got Puritan paraphrases running through my head right now, right? That that in the midst of good stories and good storytelling, um, a a hero really is only as large and as um, heroic and as glorious uh, as they are compared to the villain or the problem that they're overcoming. And so I think one of the things that you do really well in stories is you show um, the serious impact of the villain from time to time when we're talking and looking at certain themes eschatologically. And sometimes I think that's a deficiency. Um, speaking here personally in my own life, um, prior to studying eschatology uh, in any level of depth, but just looking at it as, well, that's just a one or two topic issue. I don't need to get to it. It really doesn't impact the milk and eggs day to day sort of thing. Um, and so getting a feel for and getting an understanding of how great the triumph of Christ is over over my sin and giving me new birth and a new life and faith now to live in response to what God has done. That's, whoa, okay. And so eschatology being something rather than, all right, this is kind of like a secondary thing that nerdy people kind of push up their glasses and debate about. Rather than it being that, it's, oh my goodness, this is a really big, serious villain that impacts me and my life and how I respond to things. Like that villain's been triumphed over. Right. That's incredible. That's yeah. that's the that's the biggest story. Well, it's like what Stephen has been saying over on the eschatology for kids, right? It's the biggest story, and God has included you in it. And so, stories about the end of things, incredibly encouraging book. You've mentioned a couple times um, throughout our discussion here today the chopping block. So now I'm going to ask you the chopping block question. Okay, so there's nine themes that got included into the book. All right, so talk to us about when book two is coming and when those next <laughs> themes that got put on the chopping block. What were some of those themes that didn't quite make it in this time? Are you able to oh, comment man. or give us any hints about what I, didn't quite make it in? Yeah, no, I'm actually I'm actually pulling them up right now to re- refresh myself. But um, yeah, blood was one of my early favorites. Um, that theme of blood, and I love that theme. Um, not just because I'm a boy and I like you know like bloody things or anything like that. But, but also just thinking toward, I was, I was thinking to myself, what are some of the areas in scripture we get a bit bogged down? Well, we get bogged down in Leviticus, you know, the, the priests run in there and they're, they're uh, doing their sacrificial things. And all of a sudden everything looks a bit like a butcher shop and there's blood flowing everywhere. We get a bo- bit bogged down in Hebrews. There, there's a lot of talk of, of blood in Hebrews. And then you get to the revelation and there's a veritable tidal wave of blood described running up 
um, quite high, several stadia. So blood was one of the ones I would I would have loved. I had a lot of notes on that one um, that did not make it. Tribulation um, was was a big one. Um, I stayed away from the tribulation one just because. Um, well, number one, we were out of out of space, but I also I, I, I was worried that one might edge a little too close toward millennial conversations, and I don't want to isolate any anybody from that conversation. Um, beyond that, though, uh, fear. Um, I think fear is an interesting biblical theme. Obviously, you've got the 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 constant admonitions to fear not, but fear plays a huge role um, in eschatological passages, specifically again the Revelation. Um, you see that that theme of fear cropping up quite a bit. And the admonition of fear not. You can think of several several uh, high points in scr- in the scriptural narrative where fear not is is sort of the uh, the thing being bellowed from the from the heavens. Um, I'll run through a couple of other ones just real quick. Authority, um, which I've written quite a bit on, um, and it just didn't make it. Eternal life, judgment, um, new creation. A, a lot of those those themes that you would expect that you see pop up not only in the end of the narrative or the con- the conclusion consummation of the narrative but also quite early in the narrative so yeah w- if 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 this one does well and and everyone could talk the publisher into doing a second edition i would be itching to to include some of those that's great no those are those are great i hope i hope what our audience is hearing just even from that list as well as the list that did get included in stories about the end of things is just how big eschatology is right as an aspect of our christian faith just how informed God actually wants us to be about all of these different things and how many different beautiful, like you referenced earlier, how many different beautiful ways that God has revealed himself. So much of discussions in theology and particularly on eschatology are about the mysterious things. Well, we don't really have an answer to this, but much of the discussion biblically about eschatology is about what we do know and what God has revealed. And I think stories about the end of things, very encouraging in that regard. And and maybe stories 2.0 will, uh, (laughs) <laughs> will 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 lead us to more great conversations and great questions. Well, what's something looking back on the process of writing and and the process of getting stories out um, about the end of things? What's your ideal way to read stories about the end of things? When you get your hardcover copy and you hand it to your fourteen year old daughter and you're like, "All right, go go have fun." What's your ideal way when Dr. Josh Howard sits down to read a new copy of a book that he's been looking forward to? What's the ideal way to consume and to read? Uh, a chapter or maybe the whole book in a sitting? Ooh, that's a good question. Because, yeah, I, I think one of the things that people don't appreciate about books is, you know, books is like, it's like going to dinner, right? Every every book is not the same. They're not supposed to be eaten the same. Um, if if I go out for ice cream, I'm going to eat it different than a steak and potatoes. Like, they, these things are important. Um, you know, fast food culture hadn't helped Americans in that regard. But still, like, there's different ways to read books. This one I intentionally wrote. I wanted people to get, as as you gave me credit for at the beginning, and I appreciate your kind words, but just I wanted to give people a snapshot of that story. Um, and, and many will be familiar with that kind of overall theme I'm using of creation, fall, consum- or of creation, fall, redemption, and then consummation, um, you know, whatever terms you might use for that that story. But that's kind of the way I'm trying to present them. So the way I wrote it was a chapter at a time. So, so when I give this to my daughter, for example, that's what I'm going to encourage her to do. And she's a much better reader and almost a better writer than I am at this point. So, so she'll have no problem with that, but still just encouraging her to look at each snapshot because the goal was each chapter. It's short enough that it's digestible in one sitting for sure. Um, it's, it's simply enough written that it's not going to, it's not going to bog you down with a lot of technical words or anything like that. And it gives you that sort of snapshot of that story that God's doing. And then you may return a couple days later and okay, I'm going to read that next chapter. You get a snapshot and you appreciate a theme and, and hopefully it clarifies some of scripture to you. So yeah, that would be my, my encouragement. There's nine chapters, nine snapshots, nine sittings, I would hope would be the re- way people could engage that. That's great. By the fireside, maybe outside by the lake, maybe. Oh, definitely you know, by the, fi- yeah, there you go. On the beach. <laughs> it goes better with a fire here in Michigan. Yeah. That's Kick your right. feet up. Get some s'mores out, have your coffee, your hot cocoa. Absolutely. Or your margarita, depending on which beach you're on. There you go. That's <laughs> there great. You go, yep. That's great. Well, good. Well, Dr. Howard, let me ask you this question. What's a question that you hope or you wish somebody would ask you about eschatology? Ooh. What's a question that you're like, you know, same way as writing the book. You said in writing the book, you know, hey, these are a lot of topics that I wasn't getting to teach on elsewhere. And so I was right. glad, and I think that comes through in your writing. It comes through as an enjoyable book to read. I think your love and your passion comes through 
in the book. It's it's easy for us to to be able to read and enjoy it. So it must have been enjoyable and, and passionate and a loving exercise for you to produce it. Yeah, a question I wish people man, that's a tough one. Uh yeah, we get we get asked questions quite frequently about eschatology, right? Um and typically Typically, they're technical questions. And again, nothing wrong with technical questions. You know, somebody wants to understand Isaiah 65. You, you kind of have to hone in on a passage. I get that. Um, the questions that excite me the most are the big picture questions. And not because I'm trying to avoid the technicalities. Anybody that knows me knows, I, you know, I, I, we, you and I both actually, I think, love the analytics, love the technicalities. But it's the it's the big picture ones that so oftentimes make us appreciate the big story. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, about the whole the whole theme of Christ having defeated an enemy. There, there's an enemy. Christ is the victor. God is the victor. But specifically through Christ is the victor. Um, the more we appreciate that. I, I remember hearing I don't know who first did this. I've heard a few guys do this, but they, they said that the whole of scripture can kind of be described as um, the knight killing the the dragon and getting the girl. I think I heard Joe Rigney say that one time. In any case, when I first heard it, I thought, well, that's, you know, super simplistic. I think the power behind that is it gives people it gives people a story they can understand. If, if you were to ask somebody, hey, describe scripture, man, there, there there's a lot in there and there is a lot in there, right? Like there's there's mountains. We just said you you could traverse those mountains until you die and never even never even crest the peaks. And yet at the same time, God's given us a story he wants to wants us to understand. He, I, I think God wants us to think in terms of story. Um, it, it's something that it oozes through the pages of Scripture. Um, it oozes through the words of the apostles. You read Stephen's speech in, in Acts chapter 7. He thought in terms of story. He was very aware, even being threatened with stones to kill him, he was very aware of the fact he was part of a big story. And he wanted people to understand that. Um, I would dare say early Christians... Well, Christians all throughout the centuries have understood that that theme of story. And one of the things that we've lost, I think, in our day and age, we've lost that sense of story. And that's tragic because we live in a world packed with people. I'm going to get up on a little bit of a pulpit here if I'm not careful. But we live in a world where people have rejected story. They're believing every story except the true story. And they're believing stories which have no end. There's no consummation. The dragon's never killed. The girl never rescued. They're simply what is. And Christians are sitting here in the middle of the best story ever told, the true story, the story that that dictates and forms all other stories, we have a story to tell. We, we as Christians, we have to retrieve that sense of, of narrative, that sense of story of what God's writing. So the, the, the questions that really encourage me, and again, there, it's few, right? Because people don't, I don't think in these terms, but those are the questions I love is, how is God defeating the, the serpent? How, how, is, how is God? You know, we just walked through John 1, what is that? What does that darkness being pushed back look like? So again, that that should tell you a little bit of, of why I wrote the book the way I did was just encouraging that sense of story among God's people. Yeah, and I think it comes through. So thank you for your work with this book, Doctor Howard, and thank you for all of your continued ministry and continued ongoing pastoral ministry and writing and academic work and hopefully continued beneficial writing even into the future. Do you have any sneak? previews or teases for us about what's next? What what else aren't you getting to teach about that may also become a project? <laughs> well, I, I can say, um, I got to be real careful. We have a friend across the pond um, through through our Eschatology Matters ministry, and we're, we're currently working on a project. So um, it's exciting. I, I think it'll be beneficial. Um, so yeah, we covet your prayers on that one. We're in the early stages. That's great. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Dr. Howard. I would just encourage anybody that does have a question for Dr. Howard, leave it down below in the comments. Maybe he'll get back to you. Maybe you'll actually get a big picture answer from Dr. Howard to your questions down below. You do have an opportunity now to go out and get your own version and your own copy of Stories About the End of Things. You can get that from College and Clayton Press and either contact them, ask them for a group discount or a group church rate. If you're looking to buy it for your small group, for your Sunday school, or maybe even for outreach with unbelievers. And of course, you can also buy it and purchase it from Amazon and get it over a two-day purchase. And maybe you'll get your copy before Dr. Howard even gets his author authorial <laughs> copy. That'd be pretty great. Well, Dr. Howard, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for all of your answers to questions. Do you have anything else that you'd like our audience to, to think about or to consider as they're taking a look at stories about the end of things? I mean, I don't think so, other than other than the ortho orthocardia factor. Um, that's just That's just my hope. That's my impetus. Um, scripture should make our hearts beat differently. Um, you know, the, the whole story of scripture is that God changes not just our uh our our salvation. Um, he he doesn't just take us from 
lost to saved, although as glorious as that is. But he also he also makes us a new creation. He makes our hearts to beat differently. He 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 reorients our desires and our loves. I hope this book is just one example of the ways that I hope Christians are doing that. We need to love differently. Um, and God's making something beautiful through that. So I hope it I hope it encourages that. Well, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and ding the bell to be notified about future video discussions just like this one. And we'll catch you next time right here at Eschatology Matters. Seated here at my right hand, the Lord to my Lord did command for all these ye that I will make a kingly footstool for your sake.